This is the biggest battleship ever built, Japan's Yamato. It carried these monster 46cm Type 94s, the biggest guns ever mounted on a ship. Today we cover her final suicide mission to the island of Okinawa, to beach herself and fight to the death. Japan was desperate after World War I to become a major naval power. Initially they wanted to remain allied with the West, so they signed the Washington Naval Treaty in 1922 which limited ships to 35,000 tons and 16 inch guns. They <laughs> kind of rhymed as well. You see the treaty was designed to prevent an arms race, but unfairly for Japan, for every 100 ships the US built, Japan could only build 60. So Japan made a plan to concentrate their force. They figured, why not leave the treaty, build our ships twice as big, and the Americans can't compete because they need their ships to fit through the Panama Canal. In other words, Japan is desirous to have a new deal in the naval matters on a much more reasonable basis than heretofore. In 1937, the super battleship builds began at the docks of Kure Naval Arsenal. 1.5 billion a ship nowadays, several were planned, three were made, the Yamato, Shukaku and Musashi. It was top, top secret, the docks were deepened and screened off, it was forbidden to mention the 46 centimeter guns and a criminal offence to take a picture. You didn't want to be messing with the Japanese Gestapo, the sword wielding Kenpai Tai. To give you an idea of her size, this is the Bismarck, Europe's biggest battleship. The Germans fibbed about her as well, said she was 35,000 tons, she was actually closer to 50. A lot of big ladies about. See, Yamato's not much longer, but damn, she got girth. And of course, she was packing these tight 94 18.1 inch Godzilla turrets. Not their official designation, I don't think. Imagine firing those. Sir, prepare the gun for use. But the gun hasn't been tested. If it fails, humanity is done for. I understand. Brace for the flash and recoil. Fire! Okay, well that might be a different Yamato. But this is a Sherman tank to scale. Looks scared. Uh, by the way, the frontal armour on these was 65 centimetres. I believe it's the only armour ever made so thick it was impenetrable to all existing weapons. You can shell Calais from Dover with these. They've got 42,000 metre range of 45 degrees. That's the equivalent power of firing a Ford Focus over the English Channel at 500 metres a second. Unfortunately though, the Japanese lack radar fire and remote power control, so they had to be manually range found. The rangefinder viewports stuck out like these little metal ears at the back of the turret and then it was this long metal tube that ran across the width. You look through here and the prisms then split the view from your left and right eye. The left eye was fixed at 90 degrees and you'd use a wheel to bring in the right eye to form a triangle. And If you know this angle, then you know that angle and from that you can get the length. In the viewport, when the top and bottom aligned, you knew that you'd formed your triangle. Underneath the turrets, the shells and cordites were stored. They had a system of pulleys, because the shells weighed 1400 kilograms, to take them to the separate elevators. When they reached the top, a big mechanical arm pushed them into the breach. If you want to know the details, somebody has made an insane 3D animation of the turret. I've linked it below. Unbelievable this was made with pen and paper. You know what amazes me watching that? That there was only one fatality in Yamato's turrets. Apparently a guy got cut in half by a rogue shell bogey. I'm okay. He wasn't okay. Yamato fired these Type 91 armor piercing shells for surface combat, up to 50 centimeter armor penetration. They had a breakaway wind cap and then a hydrodynamic head underneath, so they could dip underwater through the torpedo bulge and then through where the belt armor was thinner. 
If you're wondering, as I was, what the deal is with torpedo bulges, they're like an unarmoured cushion, usually filled with water, to soften torpedo explosions, because without, torpedoes cause crazy damage, because they don't penetrate, they damage with hydrostatic pressure. Yamato also fired these AA Sanshiki beehive rounds. They had a timed fuse and were filled with flechettes and rubber thermite, which burnt at 3,000 degrees. Apparently not very effective, but it did trick the Americans though, because the US thought Japan throughout the war had radar-controlled AA, which it didn't. So when they came under fire, they used to throw these little metal streamers called window out of the plane's window to disrupt the radar. As you can see, Yamato had quite the AA compliment. If it flies, it dies, I think was the motto. If you look on the port side here... By the way, do you know how I remember that port is left? Because there's never any left when my girlfriend's been near it. Hey, hey! <laughs> anyway, I had these 50, 50 Type 96 triple barrel 25 millimeters, and then a vast assortment of Type 89 40 cals and Type 93 shiki 13 millimeters. These here are the AA fire controllers that supposedly coordinate the AA, but to be honest, back then AA wasn't very effective. The US were averaging 1,050 cows per plane they took down. Also, because of the main gun's blast pressure, notice everybody running in this clip, some of the AA couldn't be manned. For reference, a blast pressure of one kilogram a centimeter squared will tear your clothes off and knock you out. Sounds like a fun time. But a three barrel salvo, produced 20 times that. You had to be 50 metres from the guns. <laughs> Yamato was the heaviest armoured ship ever built. 22,895 tonnes of armour. It was designed to take on five to six US ships at once. Had a central armoured citadel containing the boiler fire rooms, engines and ammo, as well as the classic Japanese unprotected bow and stern. The superstructure had all the latest technology. Type 98 Hoiban Low Angle Director, Rangefinder, Air Defense Combat Post, Combat Bridge, Compass Bridge, Signal Deck, and Conning Tower. At the back, you've got a signaling mast to signal to other ships and a catapult at the rear for launching spotting planes. The main armor belt was 410 millimeters of Vickers hardened. The deck was impenetrable, supposedly, to a thousand kilogram armor piercing bombs dropped under 3,400 meters. Yamato did have a couple of weaknesses though. Firstly, this belt armour is extremely thick. It's actually too thick to be welded. So they had to rivet it, which is significantly weaker. And of course, the first random torpedo she took, those rivets sheared and she took on a ton of water and had to limp home. The Japanese had a solution though. This little crossbeam. Now, I'm not an engineer, but compared to this, that does not look sufficient. <laughs> that poor ship with his wonky nose. The second problem is that the lower armour belt is the back of the torpedo bulge, so there's only two walls there to stop water. Now that might have been okay, but the Japanese didn't fill Yamato's bulges with water, and the bulkheads behind were very rigid, so often the torpedo blast would just bend the armour around them, letting water in. By April the 6th, 1945, the war had been disastrous for Japan. They'd been pushed back battle after battle after battle. The fate of the empire rested on one action, a breakthrough operation of unrivaled bravery. The Americans had just invaded Okinawa, a crucial Japanese stronghold. Yamato was to go on a one-way mission, exact maximum punishment on the Americans, beach itself and fight until destroyed. That morning, Yamato set off, commanded by Admiral Arriga. She was travelling with eight destroyers. She had no air cover. All the remaining Japanese planes had been sent to attack the American fleet at Okinawa. One gallant attempt, a final charge of the Light Brigade. Float planes were sent up to spot for US submarines, but at 4pm she was noticed by Threadfin and Hackleback. Under the cover of night, the convoy managed to lose them, and at 6am the next morning she reached Osami Peninsula. As the sun broke, the convoy moved into defensive formation, Yahagi leading, eight destroyers in a 1500 meter ring. They knew they were exposing themselves to potentially eight hours of daylight air attack. By 10 a.m. the weather is terrible for the Japanese, low, broken, 300 foot cumulus clouds, perfect for air attack. The destroyer Asashimo falls behind with engine trouble. 
By now, Yamato has been spotted multiple times. The US are still unsure of her heading. They don't want to lose her, but she's 250 miles away at the real limit of their bomber's strike range. 10.30. Admiral Spruance gives the shortest operational order in history to Commander Mitcher. You take them. 11 a.m. 2,000 Japanese planes begin Operation Kikusei from Kyushu Air Base. It's going to be the greatest kamikaze attack of the war. They're too late, though, to help Yamato. The US planes have already launched. The planes the US had launched were Curtis Helldivers, Vought Corsairs, the Whistling Death, and Hellcats as fighter support. They also sent the Turkey, the Avenger torpedo bomber. Bit of a fat boy, had to be catapulted off the ships. Also, you wanted to be the pilot because apparently there wasn't space for the radio operator and gunner to have a parachute. George Bush Sr. had one. He actually had three. He called them all Barbara after his wife. After having to crash land one, he nearly got eaten by Japanese cannibals, but that's another story. The Avengers dropped these one-ton Mark 13 Mod 9 torpedoes. Unlike the Japanese, the Americans had trouble keeping their torpedoes running straight. The submarine version of this, the Mark 14, used to sometimes run in a circle and blow up the submarine that fired it. They had to put this plywood boxtail stabiliser and pickle barrel drag wing. <laughs> Cracky, that was a tongue twister. On the, on the Mark 13 to keep it stable in the air because it had to enter the water at 26 to 30 degrees. A lot of the torpedoes were set at the wrong running depth for Yamato because they didn't realise how big she was. It should have been 18 to 22 feet, which a radio operator could have set with a screw at the back, but to save weight and fuel for the long flight distance, most of the Avengers only had a pilot. At the front, the torpedoes got a Torpex tip, equivalent to 400 kilograms of TNT. For the first 300 yards, water would run in, turn this impeller so the exploder is gradually armed, and they had a ball switch in them, so if there was a glancing blow, like this, the ball could displace in any direction, closing the contacts and releasing electricity from the condenser, and you've got a very big boom on your hands. It's uncertain how many hits Yamato actually took, but these are the confirmed ones that correlate between the US Technical Missions Declassified Report and Requiem for Yamato. 1220, a 250 kilogram bomb hits starboard frame 150, glances off the gunnery control destroying three 12.7 centimeter AA mounts, punches a 22 foot hole in the weather deck, exploding two decks below killing the entire port damage control team. Another bomb penetrates the flying deck wiping out the main radar room. A third staves in the aft 15.5 cm mount as if struck by a giant hammer, destroying the fire control station and directors. Warning lights flash on the bridge that the main turret cordite store is getting hot, being heated by fire through the bulkhead. Yamato's anti-air mounts are proving relatively useless, like swatting bugs with a sledgehammer. The 50 cal rounds are barely travelling five to six times the speed of the planes. Many of the gunners have less than one hour training. 12.45, the first torpedo hits at port frame 125. The second hits port frame 150, flooding the outboard engine room and causing a list of five to six degrees. The bridge counter floods to one degree. 1 p.m., a torpedo hits starboard frame 124, flooding and killing everyone in fire room seven. Another hits the opposite side, flooding fire rooms eight and 12, as well as the outboard engine and port hydraulic machinery rooms. Yamato is now listing 15 to 16 degrees to port. The starboard engine and boiler are counter flooded, likely killing several hundred crew in there. The list is corrected to 5 degrees, but Yamato is slowed to 10 knots. 1.30, two more torpedoes hit port. Yamato raises the Z flag. This is her final stand. 1.50, now two damaged perform evasive maneuvers. Three torpedoes hit successively, one to starboard, two to port. She lists 22 to 23 degrees to port. The ship's blisters are now too far above the water to be counter flooded. She pulls a sharp left turn to counteract the list. The Allies begin targeting her rudder and stern. 2 p.m. Admiral Araga gives the order to abandon ship. Gunnery officer Hattori locks himself in the senior wardroom to protect the Emperor's portrait and prevent it from falling into American hands. 2.18, Admiral Araga ties himself to the compass binnacle. 
His messenger Sukamato puts a cracker in his mouth, a traditional farewell to someone about to die. On the decks below, some of the sailors commit seppuku. Surrender is dishonorable. 2.20 p.m. Yamato finally capsizes with a 120 degree list. It's not until the 1st of August 1985 that Yamato is seen again, when Pisces II locates her 1,410 feet deep in the East China Sea. Her final explosion created a 20,000 foot mushroom cloud and was heard 200 kilometers away. It's likely fire reached the ammo in turret two. Of the crew, 3,000 drowned, many being dragged down by the ship's undertow. Only 280 survived, the US lost 12 airmen. The Japanese seriously underestimated US resource and strength at that time in the war, and that sometimes, as it goes, bigger isn't better, it's how you end up using it. Really, she stood no chance without air cover of making it to Okinawa. It's argued the bitter irony is that by attacking Pearl Harbor with carriers in 1941, the Japanese rendered battleships obsolete even before Yamato was delivered as they showed the whole world that carriers, not massive battleships, ruled the waves. Maybe we'll never see anything like Yamato again. Maybe. <laughs>